Great, wonderful, wonderful to see everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Japan Society of Boston. Hello, my name is Yuko Honda. And for those of you who do not know me, I am the executive director at the Japan Society of Boston. I see many familiar faces and names and many that are, are very new to us. So thank you for choosing to spend time with us tonight. Um, before I move on, we always love to ask people where you are uh, joining us from, because the wonderful thing about this digital platform is that we can connect with people outside of our physical boundary. So let us know, let us know, where are you joining us from? And while I'm at it, just a few housekeeping announcements. Please keep your micro, uh, microphones muted during the presentation so that we can all concentrate on Paul's and story, but the chat is open. So for all those questions, send them in chat. All right. So the first time I learned about Paul Tiller's story and his Japanese house in New England, I mean New England, New Hampshire in particular in New England, I was really deeply moved. Uh, I think the best word to express that in Japanese would be so it is a great delight that we are able to share his story tonight. Um, Paul Tuller has been designing and building custom furniture and architectural elements for more than 35 years. The majority of his work is inspired by traditional Japanese design and made using Japanese hand tools. From his workshop in southwestern New Hampshire, Paul has created interior spaces and furnishings that have been installed throughout New England and as far as Florida and California. In the summer of 1987, the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center commissioned the construction of two timber frames, one being Japanese, made by Japanese architects. Paul Tuller helped raise the Japanese frame in Brattleboro. Years later, in 2004, Paul found the frame and brought it to his home in Dublin, New Hampshire. And the rest of the story we will hear from Paul Sum himself tonight. So without further ado, here is Paul Tuller. Paul Sum, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Paul Tuller. I live in Dublin, New Hampshire, a very small town uh, in the hills up here. But uh, I've been uh, working with Japanese tools for a, quite a while and uh, have been working on a little Japanese house. Uh, right uh, in the top of my screen, I see Carl Barris, who is here uh, joining from, I assume, still Santa Cruz, uh, California. And he was instrumental in uh, making uh, cutting the frame and bringing the carpenters over for this little Japanese house. And uh, so uh, we have uh, a few, uh, about a year ago, I had a friend make a little video that gave some of the background, not uh, real complete details, but just a quick overview of this little house. And uh, we're going to share that with you uh, tonight. When I started focusing on Japanese woodworking, I discovered this book called The Unknown Craftsman. One of the things that they mentioned in the book was this term shibui. And the definition is a profound, unassuming, quiet feeling. And that is, I mean, uh, so hard to say, what is that? But it is something. It has to do with the proportions of the uh, pieces that you build things. It has to do with the way the wood is treated. Uh, the surfaces for a lot of the, almost everything is planed with a hand plane. The corners of the wood are chamfered. There's a 45 degree bevel that's planed onto each piece. The effect of all these sort of subtle details um, 
creates this quiet feeling. And this little house shows that. When you come in and uh, sit in this space, uh, everything is sort of in harmony. My name is Paul Tuller. I'm a woodworker and I specialize in Japanese style woodworking. When you're working with hand tools, the sound that they make as you use them gives you a lot of information. So I never would listen to music when I'm working on a project. I would have it as quiet as I could so I could hear how the tools are sounding as they cut. Started focusing on Japanese woodworking completely in a, about 1985. In 1987, I heard that the Brattleboro Museum was doing a lot of events or, uh, focused on Japan. And the big uh, final event was going to be erecting a Japanese timber frame and a New England timber frame that had been built by two separate crews on the same day. They had brought over two Japanese carpenters and there was an American who had studied in Japan who was sort of a translator and also working on the Japanese frame. They were here for just 30 days and during that time I went over and found out where they were working and I spent a day with them watching them cutting the timber frame and they were just working uh, so hard. On the day of the raising I went over to help and I could read the Japanese characters that all the pieces were labeled. They mark everything out on a grid and uh, they use a letter and a number and uh, I could read those letters and numbers so I could help sort out the pieces and so I helped uh, organize the parts and lift pieces on the day of the raising. So once the uh, event was over and they took them apart, the New England timber frame was sold to someone who was putting an addition on their house. And the Japanese timber frame went to a sculptor in Vermont who was uh, planning to put it up on his property, but he never did. 17 years later, in 2004, out of the blue, I got a call from the farm school in Athol, Mass, and they said, they had all the parts for the Japanese house and they were going to sell them at their auction. And so I decided to go down and take a look. So I drove down to Athol and there were all the pieces in this giant pickup stick heap. I mean, it was just dumped in a pile, they were filthy dirty, there was places where rats had chewed on some of the pieces. It just broke my heart to see the uh, pieces like that. At that point, I really knew how much work would be involved in building the building, because this was just the bones, it was just the sticks that form the frame, but the wall, no walls, no floors, no roof, no doors, no uh, anything. So I thought, if anyone's going to do it, it should be me. So we loaded up all the pieces uh, onto a trailer and a truck, and we brought them back to Dublin to my barn. We washed every piece. My daughter helped, and we sorted and uh, stacked all the parts uh, for the house in 2004 and figured out which pieces had to be remade. In 2017, I retired from my contracting business and my goal was to finish uh, building the Japanese house, all the interior details. Just coincidentally at that time, uh, an old friend, Aleph de Gize, uh, moved back to New Hampshire. He had apprenticed with me when he was 20, but now he was 42 years old and he had been spent the time in between working, building houses and things in Japanese style in California so he knew everything about what I needed to do and he agreed to help me. So for the next three years we worked in the summer and fall 
a day here and a day there uh, and work to finish all the interior shoji and add on the porch and the entry roof, uh, build the tokenoma uh, and all the uh, you know, specialized details to finish. And we ended up finishing in 2019, uh, one week before my daughter was married in front of the Japanese house. A lot of people think Japanese house, they think tea house, which is not what this is. A tea house is specially made just for ceremonial serving of tea, but this is a house that's just meant uh, to live in. The lower level where you enter usually has a stone or earth floor and that's where you would do cooking and store clothing, dishes, and food. And then you would remove your shoes and come up into the living space, which would typically have an area with tatami mats, which are natural fiber coverings. And then uh, during the day, uh, this space would be for living. And then at night, you would open up the closet doors, take out the bedding, the futon mattresses, and put those down on the floor, and then in the morning that bedding would be put away, and so this is your living space. Every morning, uh, wake up, usually we wake up very early, uh, five o'clock or so, have uh, some coffee, uh, have a little bit of breakfast, and then the next thing that I do is I walk out and walk down to uh, this Japanese house, and I, uh, open the door and enter into this quiet space. I sit at the table and I take a stick of incense. There are these little sticks that are about five inches long and they take about 20 to 25 minutes to burn. In the Japanese house, there's also a little uh, shrine that's called the Kamidana. It comes from the Shinto religion, and it's a, a little structure which is meant to uh, be a place where you <coughs> uh, say a prayer for your ancestors. It sits on a high spot in the room. It's not supposed to be at eye level. It's supposed to be up high. It was the first thing I do after I light the incense is look up at that. Um, and I think of my parents and grandparents and family and friends that have been uh, passed into another world. And then I just try to uh, focus on my breath. I'm just breathing in, breathing out, and trying to let uh, all the other thoughts that flood through your mind uh, not be the focus, but just my breath. Incense smoke rising, perfuming the silent air, a prayer for all. Thank you, Paul Sun. That is a beautiful, beautiful, I think, video. And I have to admit, I've seen it multiple times. And each time I see it, I have to be honest, Paul Sun, it makes me homesick. Um, it really does make me miss Japan. Um, um, like I said, uh, chat is open. Please send us your questions in chat. But Paul Sun, uh, before we start sharing a, a few more pictures about the Japanese house, I also wanted to ask you your your own story with with Japan. Where did your Japan journey start? Well, uh, I still have not been to Japan, so my. Uh, Japan story is somewhat at a distance, many thousands of miles. But uh, it began uh, when I was in college. I took a course, uh, it was actually an anthropology course called um, uh, Japanese Culture. 
and we uh, learned about things like ancestor worship and circles of friends. But one of the most meaningful things happened in the first 10 minutes of the class when the professor said, does anyone know anything about Japan? And another student piped up, they have those saws that work backwards. And the professor uh, said, no, they don't work backwards, they work differently. And uh, that, uh, and it's been many, um, almost 40 years or more, uh, stuck with me that uh, much of what we don't, we find different, uh, we think of as somehow backwards, but in fact, it's only work, it's just something that's different and maybe uh, would require a little more understanding. So I had that little piece, I had a little knowledge about a uh, little bit of Japanese culture. Then in 1980, I attended a woodworking conference where someone there was demonstrating uh, using Japanese tools to make musical instruments. And I was just very uh, captivated by the tools. Uh, I, that person was also doing a school where they were doing workshops. Uh, I, because I hadn't been able to go to Japan, I attended a couple of workshops. I, I probably took a total of three weeks, a weekend here, a weekend there uh, for a couple of years. Uh, then uh, things happened, uh, sort of a big uh, change was in 1983, I became very ill with something that I think was Lyme disease, although I tested negative. Um, I lost a lot of the use of my hands. I can't actually close my hands very much. Can't bend my wrists. Um, I've had to have both my knees replaced from damage from the, uh, my knees. Uh, so I couldn't do, I was a carpenter and I was running a sawmill in uh, 1983, but uh, I was totally unable to work for about a year and a half. So uh, when I started to be able to work again, I thought I uh, had moved to New Hampshire and I thought maybe I could uh, do something with Japanese tools. There weren't quite so much pressure on my body and I thought I was very interested. So I started to just uh, make things uh, with um, the tools and I really had very little information to go by, but I, uh, my, my wife's from California, we would go out there and the tool shop in uh, uh, San Francisco had a little book, uh, this little book, which uh, is in Japanese, but it uh, shows uh, a lot of the details of uh, a lot of different types of doors, uh, shoji and other doors. And so I tried to uh, work with a dictionary to translate certain parts uh, to get the idea of how to get started. And that's uh, what I did. I started to make shoji. And then I discovered the Japan Society of Boston. And I attended a couple of events uh, in Boston uh, when I was first starting out. And they were um, putting out at the time this li other little book called J uh, Guide to Japan in New England. And for $75, I took out a little ad uh, that pictured a shoji and uh, said that I was doing that. And I started to get work. And so because of the Japan Society of Boston, I was able to work around the Boston area. And uh, then uh, in 1987, I was getting really interested is when all these things happened in Brattleboro, went over there, uh, did you know just a, a little bit of investigating and, uh, and then uh, the house uh, parts were put in storage and uh, reappeared in 2004. And so the video sort of touched on that. Next uh, step. I, I thank you for sharing that with us because what your story really tells me is the fact that we all have different Japan stories. Obviously, I grew up in Japan. That's a part of my Japan story. And I love the fact that your knowledge of Japanese carpentry and your love and, and devotion to it is so deep that if you didn't tell me that you have never been to Japan, I would have never known. So everybody I think has a different Japan journey and I think your Japan journey is so 
um, beautiful, just the, just, the, just the same way your Japan house story is so beautiful. So I think we're all waiting, our audience is all waiting for, give us more about the Japan house. Fen, can you share us a few more pictures, please? So Paulson, tell us a little bit about this picture. Oh, well, so this is uh, the raising day uh, in August of 1987. And I was sort of on the ground moving parts around, but this kept uh, the little red circle on the bottom is me standing there at a moment of you know not doing anything. Uh, but this is right in front of the Brattleboro Museum uh, where the two frames were uh, raised on a beautiful August day. And so the carpenters came from Japan mm -hmm. for this exhibition to put this together, but the wood came from? Uh, was, well, it came, uh, it was fairly local. So there was a sawmill down in Massachusetts, I believe that um, had uh, cut the, the main pieces of wood, uh, the square, square stock, and then the round trees uh, were cut uh, in Vermont, uh, I think they might have, the host for the Japanese carpenters and Carl Barris, who was the uh, organizer and interpreter and uh, carpenter also, uh, I think they went out into uh, the host uh, land, uh, Peter Vogel, and uh, cut the trees uh, using horses actually, and for the round uh, timbers that are in the top of the uh, roof structure, uh, they cut those on uh, almost on site and hauled them back and shaved the bark off. So the wood came from either Massachusetts or uh, or uh, Vermont, yeah, local. This, this is a Japanese house that's being built by Japanese carpenters, uh, Daiku, um, in the very traditional Japanese way using local New England wood. Right. How yep. about our so, work at the Japan Society is to bridge the two cultures. This house is just that, bridging two cultures. Absolutely. And uh, they, uh, yeah, they had to work with, uh, and they were uh, shocked actually, I heard this is, I heard secondhand, but they, when they went out into the forest, they were shocked that the trees were sort of um, not very well cared for because in Japan, they said that trees would all be numbered and someone would be responsible for their care. Uh, and harvesting eventually. And in uh, Vermont, there were in, in so many trees and the people weren't really uh, keeping track of them on a one, one tree basis. Uh, so they were surprised that the uh, trees were sort of left to grow wild and not being sort of uh, cared for by a person. Yeah. Very interesting. Fen, uh, next picture, please. So, so this, how yeah. you found it. Yeah, this was, and I have to say, it's been so many years and it's still, um, it gets to me <laughs> to see that picture and remember that day uh, when I got there, uh, it was sort of unbelievable uh, that, you know, they just um, had, everything had just been thrown down. And uh, yeah, it was in um, sort of a great state of neglect, I would say, uh, but it was, uh, a, about 17 years, 16 or 17 years after the original house was uh, created, uh, the original print timbers were cut. Yeah. So um, this, this, is where, this is where the Japanese and me would say, I'm pretty sure this is when the wood really said, oh, there is somebody who came to save me. I think that's, that's probably well, they could speak. I, and I really also, because I had been doing a little bit of work by that time in 2004, I, I had been doing quite a bit of work. I was very aware of how much it would take to actually get this to a finished state. And I was not confident that if they just sold these parts in this pile at a fundraiser auction, I thought someone might bid on it and buy it, but then they would take these pieces and they'd dump them in their barn and they would never uh, follow through with what it would take to actually um, turn that into a finished uh, building. So I was, I felt that uh, I should, I should step forward and try to um, do something about it. As you say in your movie, if anyone's going to do it, 
it should be you. Yeah, I really, um, yeah, I felt uh, very, uh, I felt a personal responsibility um, because I had met uh, the three uh, carpenters who had made it. I uh, knew how much time and effort they had put in and it, uh, it seemed uh, uh, very disrespectful of that work to have these pieces like this. And uh, I wanted to uh, try to make it right. Uh, Paul, so we have a question from Peter Grilly that says, did you have to recut any of the mortises and the tenons? Had to yes. Uh, so, yeah, so a lot of the parts were still usable, uh, a majority, uh, but there were some parts that had twisted so badly in the time because they weren't together. They were just loose. So the wood, some of the cases, the wood had twisted uh, so much that uh, it could not uh, be used. So uh, I had to remake that. And uh, there was also, uh, there was, a, uh, you know, uh, all of us hope to be perfect all the time, but there was a little bit of an error made uh, in some of the little posts that hold up the main uh, roof beams that those, uh, there was somehow, those are all calculated without ever putting the building together. And there was some calculation that went awry. So uh, I had to make a lot of new posts for the top uh, to get that uh, to be all correct and straight. Um, so we did have to, and then there were other parts that never got uh, made. So there was no uh, beams to be the head piece for like tokenoma and closet. Those uh, pieces weren't there. Uh, also, the uh, they had cut uh, grooves for the shoji on the one big door opening, but the beams that went uh, internally across uh, where you stepped up from the low section up into the living space, those beams uh, didn't have any, the heading beams had no grooves for the shoji to slide in. And we could have added a piece of track under and screwed that up there, but we thought it, it wouldn't line up with the other one. So we wanted it to line up perfectly as it was originally built. So we had to cut the grooves in place. So the upside down with a grooving machine, cutting the grooves and then hand chopping at the ends upside down mm -hmm. uh, with my glasses that only focus on the bottom, cutting <laughs> upwards. It was like braille carpentry uh, to get the grooves chopped in uh, for the shoji, uh, but we did it. Um, we got it. We got it done. So it all lines up for, uh, the way it should. We have a good question um, from John Hatch, who says, "Well, given the fact that the house parts were disassembled and neglected after use, what was the original purpose of the building?" So this was, from what I understand, this was an exhibition at the Museum of Brattleboro of the different styles of post and beam architecture, right? So they just, it was just a showcase of the two different kinds. Well, of yes, but the original uh, thought was that these, this would have been put up in uh, Vermont at this uh, sculptor's home. He was planning to put it up, at the Japanese house up on his property but um, he decided that he would, uh, he want, needed, uh, he's a uh, very uh, uh, important sculptor and he felt he needed to have the house that he put up on his property look more like one of his pieces. Mm -hmm. So he ended up not erecting the Japanese house, but putting up a house of the same size, the same scale, the same proportions but made it in a way that it looks more like one of his, uh, it is uh, one of his pieces of uh, sculpture. And he actually hired me to do the roof for it because he couldn't find anyone to do the hip roof uh, the way that he wanted it done. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was, uh, you know, just a change uh, was originally he thought that he would put it up on his property, but um, it, it just didn't work out for him. So uh, the pieces, and but he saved every piece. He didn't uh, throw anything away, which is wonderful. Great. Next slide, please, Ben. So this is—is oh. is this at the Brattleboro? 
No, this is actually now in oh. Dublin in 2005. So uh, 2005, we had another raising day with uh, friends to put up the heavy timbers uh, for the roof. And this was uh, doing that raising the second time. Now, we also have a question from Michael that says, were you able to send the photos of the re-completed house to the original carpenters? I have not. I, I have not uh, been able to communicate with them. I, uh, I uh, need to, you know, work with Carl if he's still, uh, Carl Barris to see if he still has a way to reach them, but I have not uh, directly reached them. Uh, I don't know how to reach them. Next slide, please, Ben. So uh, this is uh, the center uh, post, which was a special cherry tree that they, uh, the sawmill that cut the timbers for the house donated. The, the center post, uh, when I uh, got all the pieces, I, I realized I didn't know uh, so many things I would, uh, wanted to find out. So I went to Brattleboro uh, Library and researched all the news articles about it. And one of the articles said the center post was uh, called Daikoku, uh, and that it should stand on a stone in the shape of a tortoise. And so I went over to Vermont. I thought that I should get that stone. And I went over to Vermont. I thought it should come from Vermont because that's where the house started. So I went over to Vermont and found a stone in the shape of a tortoise. And then I carved the cherry post to sit on it. Uh, so that the center big uh, post is standing on that tortoise stone. Ah, wonderful. Again, another mariage of New England and Japan here. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to try to do it as best I could. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. And so this is just the flying, uh, flying timbered roof and you can see the posts, uh, the little posts that go up to connect to the square timbers on top. Those were the ones that had to be uh, re, uh, remade <clears throat> to get everything to be true. Uh, and then there were some other pieces that just uh, were missing. Uh, there's little, uh, see the lighter colored wood uh, pieces. Uh, those were pieces that we just weren't, weren't there. So we had to cut those, uh, those are mortise and tenon in. And then the roof deck, which looks so bright and shiny, it doesn't look quite that bright now after uh, a number of years, but uh, we had to, the, it had never had any roof planks. So we had, this is right after we installed those uh, roof planks for the first time, yeah. Next slide, please, Ben. And this is, uh, so we added, uh, we, uh, when uh, it felt like it needed a little more protection for the shoji and on the front of the house. And so uh, this was one of my things that slowed me down uh, when I was going, because I said, it really needs that porch roof to protect the front. But I knew that was a lot of work. Uh, that was because the round, I wanted to use round posts that would stand on natural stones and be carved to fit. and. Uh, so that slowed me up from sort of committing to doing that. But then once uh, Aleph came back, uh, I felt with a little another person, we could uh, do it. So that's what uh, actually we did the outside elements, the entry roof and this porch while we were, we had to have custom tatami mats made because we couldn't find low, uh, ones available in the US that would fit within the space to be exactly the right size. So we had to send off uh, and they originally said it would take three months, but it took nine months to get the custom mats uh, made. So we were sort of waiting to needed those to get the final dimensions for doing the floor and a lot of things that touch the, the tatami. So while we were waiting for that, we did this outside work. So uh, we have a question from Peter Greeley that's asking, did you use any nails or metal bolts in your addition here or did you stay totally faithful to the Japanese origins that you well uh, nails? yeah so the main structure is all uh, joinery mortise and tenon uh, uh, the strips on the uh, top there there is a um, metal fastener that comes down through to hold those and uh, 
I think that that um, would have been in current Japan, there would be a metal fastener for that uh, attachment on the top there, but all the main structural elements are, uh, have uh, joinery with, you know, wooden uh, joints and pinned and things like that. Yeah. It's done very, as traditional as we could do. Yeah. Finn, next slide, please. So another photo of the addition that you did. And using the, this is where the, we had to round, three round pieces coming together and each one is carved to fit. Uh, we wanted to try to uh, showcase different types of joinery and different types of detailing with these two roofs outside. So we tried to use, uh, you know, uh, slightly different uh, design elements to try to uh, show as many uh, detailed possibilities as we could. And I think this is the right time to ask uh, what John Hatchson is asking, what species of wood are present in the house? Yeah, so the main timber frame was white pine. Uh, the sill pieces were white oak. Uh, the center daikoku center post was cherry. And so uh, uh, here I was, uh, for the uh, addition that I put on, I was using parts, uh, a lot of things that were left from past projects. I have a lot of wood I've acquired over the years and uh, I, uh, at this stage in my life where I um, am wanting to try to use that wood as much as possible, I tried to use uh, as much of wood I already had uh, in my possession rather than going out and buying new wood. So the round posts were uh, they are uh, Atlantic white cedar, which is an, in the Camacyparis family. It's the same tree uh, family as uh, Port Orford cedar, which would grow in California, Northern California, Oregon, and um, Hinoki that would be in Japan. So they're the same species. These were growing in a peat bog up in Northern New Hampshire, where the tree is meant to grow a little bit further south, but the peat in decomposing creates heat enough to allow these trees to grow. And someone was harvesting these things for fence posts. And I heard about it. I still don't, I don't remember how I heard about it, but I went up there because I knew it was a lot um, Atlantic white cedar. It was a camisiparis. I wanted to get some. And we got a bunch of these poles and uh, peeled the bark and I've been saving them. Uh, I've used them for projects over the years. So trying to use uh, wood that I have, but I did use, uh, Alaskan yellow cedar is the roof uh, framing for uh, this uh, little entry roof, uh, parts left from a project uh, years ago. And we did uh, the roof boards. We used white pine that we burned uh, with, uh, you know, to char uh, to show that as a, another design element. And then there's a few Douglas fir timbers as well, that same thing that they were left from past uh, projects and were actually custom sawn for me in Oregon uh, many, many years ago, a long time ago. So Paulson, something tells me that these poles are saying, I am much happier to be used as a pole for this house rather than a fence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they seem to, yeah. Uh, I think they're much happier this way. Yeah. Finn, next slide, please. And well, this just shows the, you know, the uh, foot of the post uh, standing on the stone and, but all that is, uh, I mean, there is metal in there too, uh, to make it strong. So the stone sits on a concrete pad underneath that and there's a uh, steel rod that comes up through the stone and into the post and then there's a, you know, hole chopped in the back so you can put a nut fastener to make sure that it's fastened tightly to the ground. But uh, that's also done in Japan today that way. Yes, absolutely. Even for the very traditional, I think, houses, it's down, done that way today. Probably not hundreds of years ago, but today, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So <laughs> these are, you know, some of the interior I, uh, shots uh, just to show a little more of what it looks like. We, I had to decide uh, so many uh, decisions were uh, I struggled with because I didn't, uh, I wanted to try to do as best I could, but I really, there were so many options. It was really hard to uh, 
say, yes, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, fortunately, when my friend Aleph came back, I had someone to sort of bounce ideas off. And that was the biggest help that he, we could talk about it because he knew all about this as well. And so we could say, you know, should we do it this way or that way? And we can make a decision. And one of the decisions was to not have tatami over the whole floor. Uh, we did one section, two thirds of the floor with tatami, but I was envisioning that down the road, um, we would have this open and available for people who want to learn about Japanese architecture. And we thought maybe having wood for one third uh, would be a little more durable. Uh, and so we made those panels. That was some other leftover wood. That's actually Sitka spruce is the wood paneling floor that's right next to the tatami. And uh, I had some uh, Sitka uh, that I had found years ago in planks and we sawed that into quarter inch veneer and then made up a sandwich panel so that we basically made wooden tatami mat size. So there's four uh, panels that are the same size as a tatami mat, but they're wood uh, on top uh, for the part of the floor. So we have two questions coming in with this picture. One is what is the height of this central room? And the other one says, which I love, more practical question of, did you have to comply with local building codes? Um, this is uh, for the local building codes, New Hampshire. It's uh, categorized as a storage shed. <laughs> um, it is not a living space uh, technique uh, because it does not have any heat and it does not have any plumbing. Uh, there's no water uh, inside the building and there's no heat. So that uh, puts it into a separate category. So I didn't have to comply with uh, the building codes uh, as a storage shed. <laughs> it's a very nice storage shed. Um, and the, the wall height is about 10 feet high from the lower floor where you enter, you come in the entry, and that height is about 10 feet uh, for the posts that uh, stand there. And so then by the time you step up into the main living space, the wall is still uh, about eight feet tall, but then you have the uh, slope up. So uh, it's another, um, you know, uh, I think it's probably five and a half or six feet taller in the center uh, uh, with uh, on top of the eight feet for the side wall. Um, so it's very, it feels uh, incredibly uh, spacious. Uh, you know, it does, uh, it's not a huge, uh, the building is only 18 feet by 27 feet on the outside dimensions. Uh, that's an English measure. Uh, and uh, so it is not a large, you know, really large building, uh, but it feels uh, very spacious uh, inside because of that uh, tall uh, flying timber group. I see. Next slide, please, Ben. So I see a Kamidana. We see, you mentioned it in your uh, film as well. Uh, yeah, I really, uh, I wanted to, uh, bring in uh, the elements that would be in uh, a traditional little home in Japan. And once again, it's my <laughs> uh, best effort. Uh, I'm not sure I've done it right, uh, but uh, I did want to uh, have a Kamidana. And uh, so I, I just, I have to say, I just, uh, I didn't make it uh, from scratch. I ended up, you know, buying it from someone who had one, uh, but, um, I, I felt that was an important uh, element. And it actually does go back to my first first you know class in college where we did learn about ancestor worship. And uh, there were certain elements that um, I really wanted to um, repeat. Uh, so when I took this that anthropology class, they uh, we talked about the fact that uh, a family might uh, not only uh, have, uh, uh, representation of their actual ancestors, but also other people who were important that they thought might not have children that would uh, remember them. So they would bring them in and uh, incorporate them into the family shrine. And uh, I 
I, that also uh, sort of uh, affected me. And so I have, uh, I have used that as a, a focus to think about uh, a lot of uh, uh, people outside of my direct family that uh, I've known that have uh, left this earth. And uh, so I, uh, it's an important part. And also there's other things there, the, the uh, little carvings on the top, those are, uh, you know, um, different uh, gods of good luck, the um, Shoki and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, Kukurokuju is there. Uh, they're carved from the root of a bamboo plant. And so they have uh, a lot of power. Um, and then there's flower arranging baskets, bamboo baskets there. And then the uh, Fusuma doors, the closet doors, I, uh, I got asked to make some of those early in my uh, career and I didn't have a, any idea how to make them. Uh, but I, uh, a friend who uh, was Japanese in, uh, down in the Boston area, she has said, oh, I have a video of them uh, refurbishing the uh, Katsura Palace. And uh, in that video, uh, it was all in Japanese and I didn't speak Japanese. And so I had to get a student from a local college to translate for me uh, what they were doing. And um, so I learned uh, the basics of making these doors uh, with many layers of paper. So I had to uh, sort of make it a little less complicated. So the doors that I make, uh, which I did many over the course of all the time I worked, uh, they have uh, eight or nine layers of paper on each side. They have a wood grid inside, just like Shoji, but then there are uh, many layers of different types of paper built up with the uh, final layer of handmade uh, beautiful paper on the surface and a removable wood trim. Uh, so I was, as far as I know, I'm one of the few people, Americans making those doors in a pretty traditional way. Wonderful. Actually, Fen, can you go back one slide? Yes. So there was a question that asked, what are the two straight narrow beams we see in the overhead? Oh, so those are the original story poles. So uh, when you're uh, doing uh, you know, Japanese carpentry, uh, the dimensions of all the uh, critical junctures and uh, points on the both vertically and horizontally are put laid down in ink on a uh, long stick like that. And then that's used to do the layout for all the parts. And uh, so I, the, you know, those were saved as well. So those are the original story poles that the carpenters made. And I had always been told that those were often kept up in the rafters in case you need to make any extra parts sometime in the future, you have all the measurements still laid out there. So those are the original uh, story poles. Fantastic. Finn, uh, let's go to slide. Yes, yes. Uh, we need to hear stories about this one, Paul Sun. Yeah, so Tokunoma, uh, the you know, beauty alcove, the spot that is uh, uh, where you would have a scroll and a flower arranging arrangement. Uh, there's so many, much variety. This was also something that took uh, many hours of thought and uh, trying to weigh how we would uh, detail it. But this, uh, this is where you see the lighter wood. This is a case where that piece of wood didn't, wasn't in the sort of kit that I got. So we had to add that. But uh, the pole, the round pole, the natural pole, uh, I had, uh, when also many years ago, I started to rate, try to grow uh, trees that have a Japanese uh, connection. And so I got a lot of uh, little four to six inch seedlings uh, that I started in a little garden in my home and then ended up uh, transplanting them, them down uh, in Connecticut where I'm originally from on some land that my family had uh, was from my grandfather's farm and I planted a number of these when they got to be about three feet high I planted them there and then soon after that though my family decided they were going to give uh, the land to the land trust to preserve it and have it be public land and so I had to arrange a 
contract that I had 20 years to come back and harvest these trees that I had planted. And so uh, that's, I had gone back over the years and pruned some of the branches off. And uh, so we went back and uh, the time was running out uh, just when we were working on all this. And so we went down there and we cut the trees that uh, at this point, they were about four to five inches in diameter, about 30 feet tall. And we uh, did it in the spring. So the bark peeled beautifully, but this particular one, uh, a bird called the sapsucker had a pecked through the bark in concentric circles around the tree. And you can sort of see those lines there. And that's where the bird pecked all these holes around the tree. And then the tree responded by healing itself and making little bumps on, in, the, in the tree. And so when we peeled the bark off, instead of little holes, there's also little bumps around, which is the tree healing itself. And so we felt that was the one we wanted to feature for the tokenoma. Uh, and uh, so that's what, you know, what we did uh, use that tree, but it's one that I grew from a little tiny seedling. And Peter Greeley says, wonderful story about that Tokonogma pole, and I completely, wonderfully agree. I mean, how, what a beautiful story. Um, a little bit of your Connecticut roots also in this Japanese house in New Hampshire. Yes, yes. No. <laughs> Next slide, please, Ben. So, so tell us a little bit about that stone. Yeah. So uh, once I, I, I feel about... Uh, a little intimidated talking, uh, like I know what I'm talking about <laughs> because I, I'm only a student of, of this uh, everything, uh, having never been to Japan, never studied really with someone who uh, I'm pretty much self-taught. But anyway, the, uh, in my reading, I felt like a small house like this in the older days would have a sand pit where you would cook with charcoal. And I wanted to, mm, refer to that, but I was hesitant to plan to cook with charcoal inside this wooden building. Uh, I was just a little nervous about the fire hazard and also the, the smoke. So normally there would be maybe a smoke hole in the a roof. And I, I just didn't feel I was wanting to do that uh, that way, uh, but I wanted to somehow refer to it. So in the local stone yard uh, in our area, there was this large millstone, uh, which was broken. It was a jagged chunk missing from it. And I thought, well, if we could cut that straight, um, we could um, put that in to represent the cooking area. And maybe at some point I could add maybe a little gas burner or something so I could heat uh, water for tea but I uh, felt like it would uh, reference the cooking uh, fire. And it, uh, so that stone is uh, 54 inches in diameter. It's 12 inches thick of granite. Uh, it was an old a millstone for grinding grain. It weighs 2,400 pounds. I didn't have anything that would pick that up. Uh, so I had it loaded on a trailer. Then I had to have a machine come in to pick it up and they set it down on some wooden timbers. And then we, in the video, there's actually a little clip of moving that in with just three of us with rollers and pry bars and wood, we moved it into position. And then we made a, a masonry pedestal for it to stand on. So it stands there very firmly. But it comes from a mill in New England. So another, another sort of showcase of, of um, Japan in America, right? Right, and then the wood on that uh, floor there, the dark wood, uh, the short uh, wide pieces, that's American elm. And I had a tons an antique tonsu that was uh, uh, Zelkova, uh, uh, Keakia wood. And so I wanted to try to refer to that as well. So this, I colored the wood uh, to match the old uh, tonsu wood. Uh, so that top deck there uh, is American elm, but it's uh, very distinctive and very similar to Japanese elm. And then the step that you step up to go up that level, that's from a local cherry tree that came down in this really big ice storm that was sawn up. 
and the two, there's a step on either side of the millstone. That was actually just one big plank that was 26 inches wide and I split it in half to make the steps. Uh, so we used a lot of all the tracks and everything. We kept the cherry theme because of the center post being cherry. Now you mentioned ice storm. So I think this is the right time for me to ask a question that came in earlier that said, how has the house fared in New Hampshire winter? Uh, well, it's been amazing. So when I first got the pieces, I contacted Carl Barris and I said, what would the foundation be in Japan? And he came back to say that the, they would use like uh, sort of uh, flat river stones on edge to be in a trench and uh, then on top, there might be some masonry to you know, attach the sills to. Uh, so I thought maybe I could try something that's sort of in that idea. So instead of in New England, we would dig down deep uh, four or five feet below frost level, put in a concrete uh, footing, uh, pour a, a piece and then build a cement wall up and then attach the house to that. But I didn't do that. What I did was I dug a trench uh, five feet deep. I put a drainage pipe in the bottom of it so water would drain out. I filled it with inch and a half stone, stone about just a little bit bigger than your fist size. And on the top, right at ground level, I poured a concrete footing, uh, reinforced uh, footing, and then attached the white oak sill to that. And well, no, I put in, uh, then we put granite uh, paver blocks in to be the actual visible, the part you see from the outside and then bolted the white oak sill to that. And the building is, is just stayed just about, I mean, it's within a quarter inch of true all the way around after, uh, since 2005. And it's had uh, snow, five feet of snow on the roof uh, and, uh, where the roof from the, the top of the ridge went straight across, the snow went straight across and then down. So there was five feet of snow on the edge um, and it hasn't moved or uh, it's been totally fine through many huge, huge snowstorms. And all the snow was on just one side of the roof. Uh, the wind would push it completely off on one side and dump it onto the other side. So it was very off balance and uh, it's been come through the, weather uh, beautifully. Wow, actually this is probably also a, a good time because you mentioned roof. Roof. How is the roof covered? Well, uh, so I mean currently it just has asphalt shingles on it just uh, at the time that I put the roof on that was right in 2005 when we first erected it. I was I didn't have much money uh, to work with. Um, I had just you know bought the parts and made the foundation and uh, what all the things. Um, so I just put asphalt shingles on, uh, something I could do myself for about not a lot of money. Um, the, you know, there were possibilities of much fancier things of tile and metal and everything. I uh, just, I couldn't afford it uh, to do it and I needed to protect it. So the next time, it's almost at the point where it might need a new roof. Uh, the next time we'll maybe uh, try to come up with a little bit nicer uh, roofing material, but the uh, little porches we added and roofs, we used a metal shingle for that, uh, which we thought was uh, nicer, a little bit nicer. And now that we're talking about different parts of the house, we have a question that says that round window is gorgeous. Uh, where did you find the design for this? Well, I mean, there's a, I knew of a tradition of having a moon viewing window. The problem I had, once again, I there was no indication of where there should be windows in the parts that I got. And we were just having to just sort of guess at what would be appropriate. And But I really wanted uh, to have a round window opening. Uh, that just seemed so, because it's so unique uh, to Asian architecture. And, and there's just something you know, special about it. And so in doing the uh, stucco work and the plaster work on the inside, uh, I had a friend who was a master at uh, those. I didn't use um, what would have been maybe more traditional where they would excavate soil from the site and use that in the siding. 
uh, the, the stucco on the inside and the outside, but I used a very old, uh, it's actually a uh, lime mortar, uh, but it's this super basic old formula that came in a beautiful color that I thought was reminiscent of what it should be in Japan. And it was something that I felt would last and, and I, my friend would, I knew could apply it correctly. So we, you know, made the round window. It's not necessarily looking in the right direction to view the moon through it. So there we have a little problem uh, that the moon, you can't actually view the moon through it, but it has that same wonderful feeling of uh, moon viewing shape or moon window. Wonderful. Next slide, please, Ben. So we see the, we see the window better here. Yeah, it is actually quite round. The somehow the photography and putting it into the computer has stretched it a little bit sideways, uh, but it is quite round. But and then I embedded uh, bamboo uh, grid in there, and the uh, shoji that covers it has the reverse of the bamboo. So when it slides over, it gives this interesting pattern created by the shadows of the the opposite. Uh, uh, Kumiko, the lattice work and the bamboo. Wonderful. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. Yes, this is, I think this is the time. I think there was a question earlier that said, did the Japanese carpenters ever get to see um, your work? And Carlson said, yes, the photos from 2017 have been shared with Moria Susan. Oh, oh great. Yes, yes, and, and the other carpenter. So, okay, we have a question that says, um, is is it insulated? What do you do in the winter? Or how traditional are Jap traditional Japanese houses insulated for that matter? Well, I'm not an expert on for sure, but I mean, I think in general, there wasn't much insulation in a traditional house. So this does have a little bit of insulating board in between the two inner and outer layers. Uh, it has a rigid foam uh, inch and a half, uh, but I don't, it's not heated. I don't use it uh, nearly as much in the winter because it is as cold as the outside. A, a lot of winter in New Hampshire is very, very cold, but I have storm doors that I cover the outside and so it protects the interior and uh, so, but it, you know, it's usable up until, you know, now and until, and then it'll just be till, uh, you know, April, it'll be, you know, less use, but uh, it does not have any heat and very, you know, minimal insulation, but it helps protect it from getting too hot in the summer. And it holds the heat at night a little bit uh, in the in between seasons. Yeah. Next slide, please, Ben. Oh, so this is uh, just so this is what I've been doing. Uh, we got the interior done and uh, but then I said, I need a Japanese garden to go with it. And so I had a, a design created, uh, which featured a uh, pond and, you know, a water feature, a pond, a cup, uh, pond. And uh, I, I couldn't find anyone that I warmed up to as far as to actually build it for me. And I couldn't afford, I did get some prices that were sort of uh, way beyond my budget of uh, being able to do this. Um, so I decided that I was gonna have to just um, do my best to build it myself. So this is what I've been doing all summer is uh, creating uh, this pond and water feature. And I just, I came up with the idea of just doing it with cinder blocks and rebar and concrete to form the shape. It's an oval, it's 20 feet by 24 feet oval. And then there's a little connector piece and then it goes up to a stream bed. And then there's another uh, little pool at the top with a waterfall that comes down. And then there's another waterfall right uh, where you see the cinder blocks are stacked up higher there. That's the base part of a, what will be a little waterfall cascading down. And then uh, I had to use a uh, rubber liner to uh, uh, contain the water but um, anyway, so if we go through those, uh, yeah, ben, very... can, yeah, I think we have pictures. Yes, 
So you have to put, uh, we put in the cinder block, then we put in sand to make a smoother shape. Then we put in a text, uh, geotech uh, felt that padded it. Then we put in the liner. Then we started to arrange some pretty large stones around the edge. Uh, and so there's a, in the left corner there, that's one of the larger stones that we brought in. They were all from my property, but they were, I had to bring in a big machine and uh, they had to be moved quite a distance to bring them in. So then the, there's another couple slides, I think yeah. about the pond. Yeah. yeah, so then this is, you know, in process. Uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how it looks right now, but it's, um, it's going to look, I think, a lot better once I get done, but uh, we've been arranging the stone and uh, there's, uh, we have uh, a lot that will uh, be done to minimize the effect of the liner and make it so that it looks uh, much more natural. So Finn, I think we have one last slide that kind of gives us an idea of what to look forward to, right? And so yeah, there's, this is just part of, and once again, this is still a lot has changed since this, but this is sort of testing that the water could flow uh, through the waterfall feature part at the top. And there's going to be like a zigzag bridge that crosses over the stream. And uh, so it's going to hopefully look uh, nice once we get done, but we uh, didn't quite get it finished this summer. Just was working on it on Monday and Tuesday for the last, that was the, the end. We had to stop because it's getting quite cold and uh, the ice is starting to form on the water. <laughs> Yes, yeah, time to stop. Thank you, Finn, for those slides. Um, Paul San, time flies when we're having a wonderful time. I think this is where I'm going to have to ask you, what are your plans for the future for this house? I know you'll you'll finish the, the garden next summer. That's my hope is that by next fall, we'll have the garden at least, you know, well along. I'm sure it won't be done uh, because plants take a while to uh, work, you know, fill in, but we'd have uh, the garden uh, roughed in. And I would like to uh, just make it available in some way to the public that's interested in Japanese culture and architecture. So I don't have a definitive plan, but I would be for any group that's interested that would like to come, I'd like to make it available. Uh, Japan Society of Boston wants to get a road trip. I'd be happy to uh, welcome you. And then other, uh, I might, I think maybe it might be that I would have it, you know, one day a month that it would be available you know, publicize. I do uh, sort of maintain, sort of roughly maintain a website. I can't say that I uh, update it all the time, but uh, I will have, I do have a website uh, that's just my name, uh, paulteller.com, and has the story of the Japanese house there. It has the video, and I will be adding to that once I have it ready for uh, guests to uh, welcome guests to see it. And your, the video that we showed earlier you, is also on YouTube. So if you Google New Hampshire, uh, Japanese house, New Hampshire, um, you will be able to find it, correct? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, there's a lot of, I think I, a lot of us are thanking you for this beautiful presentation, but Peter says it very well. Your house is a treasure honoring Japan and New England. Thank you so much, Paul Sun. This, this presentation was a gift, but your house is a bigger gift, I think, for all of New England. I think uh, Peter is correct. It's a treasure um, honoring both Japan and New England. So thank you. Thank you for your work and thank you for spending time with us tonight. Thank you. All right, before I let everyone go, I have a selfish uh, request uh, bear with me for just a few more minutes. Ben, can you bring back our um, upcoming events? So on Tuesday of next week, on November the 9th, we are actually launching a poetry club. Um, we call it Kukai Yoku. Uh, in Japan, we call it Kukai. It's a poetry club. Just like a book club, you come together. Um, but instead of reading a book, you come together and read a poem. Um, you don't have to come prepared. But if you, if you would like to share your poem, your haiku or your waka, um, please bring them with you. This is going to be happening once every two months. Um, so this is our first um, Kukai, JSB Kukai, and the um, uh, theme for this Kukai is Locked 
gates and distant loved ones, which I think is very appropriate um, now that we're still unfortunately living in the era of the pandemic. Um, and following that, on December the 2nd, we will be doing an event on the Shikoku pilgrimage. Um, John Lander has published a new book of photography, photography book on the Shikoku pilgrimage, and he will be joining us to share um, his, his story about Shikoku pilgrimage. So um, once again, thank you, Paul Sun. Thank you for um, sharing your time with us. Um, thank you, everybody, for sharing your time with us. Um, I hope we get, to, you know, I think we're all looking forward to the, uh, you know, Japanese house with the beautiful Japanese garden. And, and we do look forward to being able to come visit. And yes, I am, uh, once it's open semi to public, I am planning a outing of JSB out to New Hampshire to come visit the Jap Japanese house. That would be great. So yes, Paulson, you're not getting rid of us yet. Um, once again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you very soon in one of our programs again. Thank you for sharing Thursday night with us.